prayer baton, and he will pass that on to another one of you guys. Why is no one looking at Dave? Steven, Steven. come on. Great pass. Really pass. Alley-ooped him. <laughs> Football people. <laughs> oh, actually, that's track, huh? <laughs> um, dear God, thank you for Debbie. Um, thank you for bringing here, her, uh, her here and bringing us here. God, I pray that you will just uh, uh, bless her words today. Be with her as she's speaking. Uh, be in her as she's uh, speaking. May, may, may what you want to be said be said today and be in our minds. And may, you want to be, may what you want to be heard uh, be heard today. And you know, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Is my mic on? All right. Can everybody in the back hear me as well? No, cannot. What should I do? Should I just do like this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Put it on the Right there? Right at the bridge of my nose? You still wouldn't be able to hear me. You just hear my breathing through my nose. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. <laughs> um, I was just telling Andrew, you know, I was actually looking through your pro Okay, first of all, SPS, I know I don't, have, I don't have time to waste. I have, I realized I've prepared way too much for you guys. So that's why yesterday I couldn't actually even go through the flood. I just had to tell you there was one. So I, I realized today I have 16 pages of notes. Usually I have 16 pages for a full SBS. You guys are a little bit more condensed, so I'm gonna try to plow through it. Okay, but one of the things that I really want to let you know is, this is a really legitimate program you guys are in. Seriously, it's so legitimate. And um, one thing I do want to remind you as you guys are doing your homework, is just the reminder that, remember, we are kind of like the Benedictine monks, and what we've been given in our hands are the utensils at the altar of God. And it just so happens what you've been given right now in your hands is your homework. <laughs> so treat your homework as if you are doing them at the altar of God and offer them up as a sacrifice because it really does honor God. Um, you know, I was looking at my notes that I took when I was here for my DTS 10 years ago and I, read, I was reading through it and I realized how prophetic it was. <laughs> Deeply prophetic. <laughs> Scary prophetic. And I really pray that that's what your notes will be like for you. Ten years from now, you're going to read through it and you're going to be like, what? How did I even think of that, right? A couple things I wanted to define for you guys. Can I just erase this for just the time being? I just need the board space. Two things I kind of wanted to explain to you guys um, that I, I don't feel that I did a good job yesterday was two words. One is the word sin and the other is the word righteousness. And I know we spoke about that. But I think, you know, when we talk about, you know, I've taught junior high, I've taught high school, I taught college, young adults, you know, um, and one thing I've noticed about evangelical Christians is we don't know our basic terms. So I could, ex I could go up to somebody and say, can you explain to me Esther? Esther might be a little bit different, so let's go. Can you explain to me Ellie? <laughs> uh, what is sin? You don't have to answer me. Right? What's, explain sin to me. What is it? It's like, uh, it's the stuff that offends God. Right? And, and some people will say things like, ah, oh, it's going to a nightclub. <laughs> right? It's going to a rave. I'm not sure, doing drugs. Right? So, oh, actually, no. Sometimes God's actually at a nightclub. God sometimes at a rave party, believe it or not. Right? So it's, sin is a very un, it's, it's like a, one of those like, mm, I'm not quite sure what it is. What is it that I'm doing that it's, that it's offending God, right? Sin in both the Greek and the Hebrew, it basically, you guys know this, you guys have heard it a billion times, right? Sin is tied in with the word perfect. And we often use this word, and it's a very, it's like a love-hate word relationship that we have with this word perfect, right? We want to be that, but we know we're never going to get there. It's this love-hate. Sin actually means to miss the mark, and it often is associated with shooting arrows, right? So when you miss the mark, you've missed the center, you've sinned. In the context of what we were talking about yesterday, how do you miss the mark? 
right? It's talking about being in the image of God. And you're like, uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. How do I actually live this out, being in the image of God? Well, you know, one of the things I want to say is it's really linked with this word perfect. Now, the, okay, I keep bringing in Greek, so forgive me if I'm irritating you. The Greek word is, it's a word transliterated. It's, it's this word called telos. Telos means it's the end or it means perfect. Generally, it means complete. Right? So when Jesus is perfect, what does that mean? He's complete. He is everything he should be. Right? God is perfect. Right? When you go to Exodus, he says, I am that I am. It's a great name, right? right? It's the Hebrew, right? And he says, I am perfect. I'm complete. I'm everything that I am that I should be. So for individually, if you are called to be perfect, it's not that you have to be this imaginary amorphous, amorphous thing of perfection, right? That's what Richard Foster calls, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, he calls it spiritual pornography, right? It's this fantasizing of perfection, right? right? It's everything you were meant to be. If you were completely sinless, then why the heck would you need God in heaven? Right? Perfection and completion is who you were created to be and everything that you were made to be, you are. Without insecurity, without shame, without fear, without fear of rejection. Everything that you were made to be in the, in the image of God, you are. That is called telos, perfect. You have met the end. Telos means end. Wholeness, perfection. Right? That's, and when we miss that, when we are not as kind as we should be in the image of God, or sometimes love is being able to do exactly what Yo did, to set a boundary. Right? That's love. Right? If you don't love someone, you just let them do whatever they want. You go straight to hell. Good for you. Right? But love means law. That's why God gives law. Whack! He sets a boundary. Right? <clears throat> if you study really good artists, the first thing they do is they set a boundary for themselves. A certain canvas or specific lines. A very famous artist, her name is Linnea Spranzi. Incredible artist. Her wor works, is like a small piece, sells for 10,000 each, right? She's a Christian. And she says that before she begins her artwork, she sets very strict lines for herself, boundaries. And then within those boundaries, she can be as free as she wants without fear of going, doing something crazy. So this is law. This is what Yo did, this is what Andrew did, right? Whack! Yeah, I said a lot. Now, <clears throat> the word righteousness is also going to be tied in with this image. Oftentimes when we think of being rightly ordered, the first word you think is priority. Like, you gotta, you gotta get right priorities. You gotta set priorities in your life, right? And the first image that you get is what? You get this image right here. You get a list, yeah. right? Yeah. Number one is what? First priority? God. God. That's right. God. Second priority? Others. Okay, usually people say family. Right? And then three, friends. Okay, I'm having super handy, ucky writing right now. And then job, food, and in and out. <laughs> if you're from the West Coast. Yes. I actually live on the West Coast and I only eat in and out like once a year. Oh, I'll be quiet it's because you don't live in California. That's why you say that. We have so many other better things than in and out. No, I'm joking. <laughs> okay, so oh, I just spoke about blasphemy. Don't pick up stones. My God. <laughs> so this is usually our understanding of priorities. I'm going to actually present to you a different paradigm. I think a rightly ordered person has me at the center. Right? You're like, oh, that's, that's blasphemy. It always has to start with you. And then I'm going to say to you that the priority, this is where we, get it, where we get things a little bit mixed up, is this layer right outside is God. And every decision, family, 
friends, right? And every layer that goes out from me goes through God. And that's rightly ordered priority. You live in layers. And it's always the next layer out that's the most important layer. What is the filter through which I make all decisions? Because God doesn't take, ever take away your gift of choice. Because if he did, he'd make you a robot. We'll talk about this in Job, right? But if it's the very next layer out from which I make all decisions, from which I filter out and treat my friends, is this layer of God, you are rightly ordered. Right? Augustine says this very famous quote. He says, love God, do what you want. If you become a rightly ordered person, right? He says, love God. Do what you want. Because you'll be doing what God wants. Right? It's rightly orderedness. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the week. But for now, I'll just leave that image up there. So kind of, I just wanted to get those thoughts out before we dive into today, I was telling people that today is my favorite day. If Andrew and Yo are okay, I'm gonna go just slightly over 12 o'clock. Okay. okay, so because we started at 9.15, okay? I'm just gonna claim my rights, I'm just gonna say. And also because uh, this is actually, for me it's been the most impacting teaching, preparing and also teaching, so I really wanna take you guys through some really good moments. All right, so let's start, let's back up with to the flood. So the flood happens, I know I didn't talk much about it, but I will try to talk about the themes of the flood as we talk about other topics. So I won't chip you off, I promise. So the flood happens, Noah sends out a bird, he sends out a raven, a white bird, animals come back, he finds land, he lands, and then what does he see? What do you think he sees? dried land, but what is there around the dry land? There's a lot of corpses, a lot of dead bodies, okay? And it says that Noah, first thing he does is he builds an altar. Builds an altar and then God makes a covenant, right? He says, I will never send flood again. And it's an unconditional covenant because God doesn't say, if you do this, I will never send the flood. He just says, I promise I will never send a flood again to destroy the earth. It's very unconditional. And then Moses, all, uh, Noah builds an altar and he sacrifices an animal and God gives a command, do not eat animal with its life, right? So starting here, it seems like people start eating a lot of meat, right? Now before that, were they all vegetarians? I don't know, right? It, it, it doesn't say. So maybe, maybe not. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we go to chapter 9, verse 20, okay, uh, who can read for me? Tesun, would you like to read for me? Chapter 9, verse 20, it's a great verse. <laughs> can you read from chapter 9, verse 20, all the way to, let's read to 25, 20 to 25. Tessun, can you read it? Are you more comfortable reading in Korean? Yeah. Read it in Korean. Give us a flavor of Korean. Yeah. That's awesome. You're in an international school. Okay, thank you. Ah, Korean sounds like you, it always ends with the word ta, ah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. That's the ending. It's the formal kind of an ending. Okay, so let me t let's talk. <laughs> thank you, Tessie. Let's talk about this story. So one of, okay, so Genesis has a lot of crazy stories. That's why Genesis is one of the most difficult books because it has these crazy stories. Noah gets drunk. He's the first, it says, if you look at a footnote in the ESV Bible, it says he's the first to plant a vineyard. 
and he takes the, the juice of the grapes, yeah, if you let it sit a little, what happens? It starts to ferment and becomes alcohol. Well, he starts to drink this thing because it you know, makes him feel good. I, think he, I personally think he has PTSD. You know, uh, if you look at it from a psychological perspective, I think he's traumatized from, from watching the destruction of the world, right? Not a, not a happy thing. I think, and so he kind of wants to make himself feel a little good, right? Who of you have not done this in this room? Okay, I personally have never gotten drunk, but that's because I do other things, like shock or something, right? So we all have our, we all have our coping mechanisms, right? And I think Noah gets a little too drunk, and what happens when you start drinking a little too much? Your body starts to heat up, right? And Noah just starts to, you know, peel it all off, right? And he's lying. He's completely passed out. I bet you some, well, at least one of you have done this in this room. <laughs> Somebody always has done this. I think it's hilarious. So Noah is kind of lying drunk, this very holy man of God, right? God says he's righteous. Not so righteous then, but it's okay. So he's lying drunk, naked, and his younger son, Ham, comes in. And he, now this is a, it's one of those very kind of like, you could look at it two ways. It says either Ham literally saw his father's nakedness and laughed. So, oh my god, look at that, right? Or it's, it, other people will believe that to see someone's nakedness, um, someone will translate, is to actually have sexual intercourse. So some people believe that Ham actually rapes his father. Yeah, and it's gross, right? Uh, I personally don't think it's that because the actual word, the euphemism, the actual euphemism is to uncover someone's nakedness and not actually to see someone's nakedness, right? So I personally don't think, I think those commentary people need to wash their brains, <laughs> right? So he sees his father's nakedness. There is some kind of a perversion in him. And then um, Job, Job, Job. <laughs> what is his name? I keep wanting to call him Jonah. Noah wakes up and he knows what his son has done to him. Okay, either he has raped him or he has mocked him, which I personally think is mock. And then Noah does the weirdest thing. He doesn't curse Ham. He curses his son, Canaan. Now there's two ways of looking at this. Either commentary uh, scholars believe that uh, Canaan represented all of the kind of perversion. There was something in Canaan that was very perverse, and Noah catches that, and he's like, your son is just like you, I'm gonna curse him. That's a big, strong possibility. Another possibility is, for all the fathers in this room, I don't know how many there are, Mark, there we go, it's one thing to curse me. It's a whole other thing to curse my child. You know, you could curse me, but don't curse my child for what I've done, right? And I think that's the severity to which Noah is taking this. And he says, cursed be Canaan. So the very next thing that you'll see is the genealogy, right? Here is a Toledoth in chapter 10, verse 1. These are the generations of Noah. And this is also called the Table of Nations. Um, Nelson's actually gives a really good um, overview of the Table of Nations, so if you want to take a good look at that. But we don't have very much time, so I won't go into all that much detail. But it says, um, it gives you the line of Ham, uh, it gives you the line of Japheth. Um, I've done a lot of research on the names. I haven't been able to find very much for Japheth yet. So maybe if I ever come back in 10 years, I'll be able to talk a little bit more about the genealogy of Japheth. But let's talk about the genealogy of Ham, starting in verse 6. I'm going to read my version, okay? Ham, his sons were Cush, which is considered, um, believed to be Ethiopia. And then it's Egypt, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. So they become their own kind of nations, and they're all descendants of Ham. And it says, verse 8, Cush fathered Nimrod, he was the first on the earth to be a mighty hunter. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now you read that and you think, ah, oh, cool. I want to be like Nimrod. I want to be a mighty hunter. I don't want to be a Nimrod. I want to be like Nimrod, right? Okay, well, when you consider the word mighty hunter, think about it. 
Starting in, in Noah's time, God allows people to start eating meat. Well then, what does Nimrod start doing? He starts going out and starts to excel at killing animals. Is this, is this the image of God that's being projected out? Just taking life. He was a mighty hunter. He knew how to hunt all sorts of animals and kill great quantities. And when, once you start having an excess, if you've studied economics, right, what do you do? You start to build a mass wealth. Once you start to amass wealth, what do you start to gain? You start to gain power. And that's why Nimrod is the first, it says, it's recorded, to start building kingdoms. Right? What are some of the kingdoms that he builds? Verse 10, right? The beginning of his kingdom was what? Babel. Who built the Tower of Babel? Nimrod. He built Erech, Akkad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. <clears throat> There's a reason why I'm showing you this poster. But, you know, so I started studying the names of these cities, okay? The, the, the city Kalne, when you look it up, the name of the city is something akin to the fortress of Anu. Okay? Who is Anu? It's this guy right here. He is the god of the sky. It seems like Nimrod starts to initiate what worship? Idol worship. Right? He builds a city called Erech. Verse 10. And this is, a this is a city also dedicated to Anu. What is he doing? You know, religion, power, and money are always tied together. You know, why does Paul almost get stoned? Why, oh no, not almost. Why does he get stoned? Right? It's because he was talking to a girl who was demon-possessed. and Was it that's why he got stoned? But, you know, he, he, she cast out the demon, no longer can make money, and the people are angry. They, there goes their economy. It's not really so much about religion. It's always about money. You Idolatry. Again, the three things that are always connected. Sure. What did I say? Religion, Religion <laughs> politics, and money. <laughs> They're all tied. So in America, what is your religion? It's democracy. Democracy is your religion. Whoa, whoa. Hey, I'm not a socialist, all right? <laughs> I'm not a communist. I, I'm just a Christian. Okay. And then he also builds the city called Nineveh, which you'll read about in uh, Jonah, right? Not a good city. So that's kind of the descendants of Ham and this, this weird, mysterious figure, uh, Nimrod. If you study the origin of religions, most religions, they actually stem out of the teachings of Babylon. From Babylon disseminated most religions of the world, including Hinduism, Buddhism. Buddhism comes from Hinduism. If you, let's read the line of Shem in verse 21. It's an important line. He is the father to a guy, it says, to Shem also the father of all children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. Now this figure, Eber, is important. Eber, <coughs> his name is actually also pronounced Ebiru. Or it can actually pr be pronounced Hebiru, which sounds like Hebrew, Hebrew right? So he is the father of actual, uh, he's the ancestor of Abraham. And it's through this line that Abraham it comes. So you get very, three very distinct um, genealogies. Some people like to say that Canaan is, that, that um, Ham and Canaan are the forefathers of the African continent, which I think is just ridiculous. And it talks about why, it's just nonsense. I think it's just, anyway, we don't need to go there. So when you look at the table of nations in chapter 10, you, what do you see again? People start to multiply. Multiply. And as they're multiplying, you get to chapter 11. So I want you to know, the events of chapter 11 happen after, uh, before the events of chapter 10. Chapter 10 are, is just like a general long picture, and chapter 11 is a very specific event, right? Because you see in chapter 10, it says that they spoke many different languages, whereas in chapter 11, they only spoke one language, right? So let's take a look at the Tower of Babel, and it's very much connected with the ideas of the flood. Chapter 11, verse 1 to 2, who would like to read for me? Pine, can you read really loud for me? All right. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. 
As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of the Babylonia and settled there. Mm. Good. So this may have most likely been what the Tower of Babel looked like. Now, what does it look like to you? Yes, who said that? Awesome, you're so smart. Yes, it's the pyramid figure. Oh, stop. <laughs> All right. This is actually the precursor to the pyramid. Pyramids, if you look at the original um, earlier designs of pyramids, they look more like this than they actually do, more flat surface. So this is called a ziggurat. Did somebody ask something? Okay, sorry. So it says that he, this was, uh, people started to move east to the, uh, to the land of Shinar, which is right around this area. It's this area right there, okay? This is kind of where Babylon is, Babel, Babylonia, Akkad, right? Nineveh is up here. So it's that kind of that region. And Nimrod seems, starts to build his city, his tower, right? Let me tell you what uh, Josephus, now if you guys know Josephus, he's a Jewish historian that was alive uh, during the time of Jesus. He is not a religious man, he's quite secular, and he actually writes for the Roman Empire. So don't, don't think that like, and then he actually writes this many thousands of years later, okay? So don't take this as gospel truth. But this is what Josephus says about Nimrod. He says, Nimrod was the grandson of Ham, son of Noah, and he was a bold man and great strength of hand. He says, Nimrod eventually turned the government into a tyranny. It's the pyramid all over again, and who's at the top this time? Nimrod, right? Because he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And it says that he was trying to turn men from the fear of God by bringing them onto constant dependency on his power. Right? He was a mighty man, right? So you see that whenever you see mighty men, it's actually not a very favorable phrase, right? And he starts building cities and dedicates them to Anu, idolatry. And then he says, according to Josephus, that he will have revenge on God if he ever tries to drown the world again. And he was trying to build a tower too high for the floodwaters to ever reach, right? And he says that it was cowardice to submit to God. Now, this is Josephus, thousands of years later, after, after Nimrod. But this is kind of the Jewish mystical understanding of Nimrod. So the Jews actually don't view Nimrod in a favorable way, right? So you should never build, name your children <laughs> Nimrod. So we get to the Tower of Babel. And if you were in an SBS, one of the things that you would have been looking for are repeated phrases, right? The, what the most repeated phrase in this uh, section is the phrase, come let us, right? They say in chap chapter 11, verse 3, I don't know what it says in your, your Bible. Carrie, what does it say? Come, come let us. Come let's build, right? Great. So it's a contraction, let's. It is a contraction for let us, right? So come let us build bricks. So what did they do? They started creating technology on baking bricks. They're beginning to advance, right? It says, come let us build a tower and a city high. Come let us make a name for ourselves. Remember what names are. They're creating their own identity. And this phrase, come let us, is actually going to be used many times throughout Genesis. It's when, uh, when the two daughters of uh, Lot, right? The, the, what did they say? Come let us make our father drink wine. Right? It's this formulation of us doing whatever was right in our own eyes. Right? You'll get that phrase a lot in the book of Judges. And so God says, chapter 11, verse 6. Who wants to read it for me? Would you like to read it for me? Jonggut. Jonggut shi. And they all speak the same language. After this, Nothing they said to be really impossible for mm -hmm. them. Come, let's be down and confuse the people and mm -hmm. the first language. Mm -hmm. Then they won't be able to understand each other. Speech, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. This word, it says that nothing that they plan to do will be impossible for them. It's this Hebrew word, batsar. Okay. I just sent the PowerPoints as a PDF to Austin. So Austin should be getting that to you guys. So 
starting tomorrow, you guys can move through these PowerPoints with me. This word batsar, it means basically boundary. It means to restrain, to fence, to fortify, to make inaccessible. It's interesting, right? God says nothing that they plan to do will be impossible for them. What does that mean, right? Like why a guy can't control? But it has to do with this thing called human choice, right? God can't force things on us or else he wouldn't be God and we wouldn't be humans, right? And it says that if he leaves them unified with this one language, what will they do? They will unify. And there is this thing called, how many of you guys know Don Gilman? One, oh. oh, my heart is so happy. I, mean, I was teaching in Taiwan and nobody knew who Don Gilman was. Broke my heart. Man, Don, is, Don was an incredible human being in the image and the likeness of God. <laughs> Ah, I miss Don a lot. He passed away two years ago with a heart attack while he was in San Francisco. Okay. He used to teach this thing called the law of progressive, I know it's a long name, progressive spiritual whew, atrophy. Man, that's a mouthful. Okay, so it's a law. Progressive means that it happens slowly. It doesn't happen all at once. Spiritual atrophy. Atrophy basically means, you know when you don't use your muscles? If uh, people who have been bedridden for a long time and they haven't used their legs, they can't actually walk because they no longer have any muscles in their legs. This law basically says, you know, I step away from God, and I step away from God again, and then I step away from God even more. And eventually I'll get to a place where I'll choose to completely turn my back and say, I don't want you. That is a place where you, we have gotten to a place of complete unrepentance. There is no room for repentance. God can give as many opportunities to repent, but if we have come to a place in our heart where we have become completely atrophied, we won't receive grace even if God extends. Now you're like, wait a minute, can that happen? Well, the Old Testament says it can, and that's why it says that God comes and brings judgment. Whenever you see God bringing judgment on a nation, we, you can never say that God get, did not give them ample opportunity. He says to Abraham, I will give the, Am the, Am the Amaleks 400 years. So I don't know how many more you want to give Right? And when you talk about the sins of the, the nations, it's like offering up babies in fire to Molech. Right? It's like prostitution of women and men as temple prostitutes. Right? It's these gross injustices that we would never try to stand for in America. And God is deeply offended and just, right? He wouldn't be a good God if he had not brought justice. Right? And so it's this place that I really believe the people were in the time of Noah, right? Every thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. Continual spiritual atrophy until they finally said, we don't want you. And Babel is in high danger of getting to that place, a place where there is absolutely no room for repentance. Because let's imagine, what would a world look like if there was no batsar, right? If, if, if it was impossible, right? The people could do whatever they want. Might is right, right? The most cunning people always win. Strength rules, right? This is a scary, scary world if God didn't put boundaries and limitations and restraint. This is God's, one of God's greatest blessings for our lives is the gift of law, right? And often, you know, the Jewish people, when their children are being raised, do you know what one of the gifts that they'll get? We like to give teddy bears and, you know, whatever, polar bears and dolphins, right? The Jewish people will actually give a toy plush uh, Torah score, scroll <laughs> to teach the children that the law is warm, soft, and is your friend, right? If, so I want you all to go out when you have kids. <laughs> Buy them a Torah scroll. Teach them to love the law. That's why David, all throughout 119, 
oh how I love your law. Right? It's just, the entire 119 of Psalm is about his love for the law. But don't worry, I believe repetition is the mother of instruction, so I will repeat that about five times before <laughs> we're done. So God says in verse 7, He says, Come let us. He's speaking in the Trinity, right? Come let us go down. And they're confused their language. Right? And so what does God's judgment, what is God's judgment ultimately? His judgment is His grace to prevent this. Yeah. Right? And that's the same thing with the flood, just like Mark was sharing this morning. You know? Every evil, every thought of the heart was only evil continually. It really saddens me because I know I could get there. But praise God! There is a restraint of the Holy Spirit on our lives, right? And He constantly teaches us to become in the image of God. Right? That's why He comes to live in us. So, at the division of language, I have to use this little corner of the chalkboard. Sorry, you guys, I have to keep erasing. I'm going to just draw you a really good image. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Did somebody take a picture of it? Yeah, I wrote it down. Ah, nice. Sorry. Ah, no, don't be sorry. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> they say you're never supposed to erase side to side because you, your butt shakes. <laughs> so you're supposed to always erase up and down. <laughs> oh man, that one just got recorded, huh? <laughs> it's okay. It's good teaching instruction. Yes, yes. Revelation. Revelation. It's all you can put that in your chart. <laughs> All right. So what happens at the Tower of Babel? Do not put that in your chart. Okay. Let's, let's bring it back. So in the beginning, in the beginning, there was language, one language, right? Until the time of Babel, where what happened? Language divided, right? into many, many languages. Now there are, gosh, more languages than we can imagine. Something like that, and that's just insane, right? So many languages formed from the one language. Linguists will actually say this is probably a probability. Wow. I was reading a book, it's called Guns, Dreams, Steel by um, a guy named um, Jared Diamond, and he says that he, he's incredible, he won the Pulitzer for this book, it's an incredible book, that most languages can, he can trace it back to three sources. Whoa. Yeah, so he can trace it back, and he's very credible. And among all the languages, what starts to happen in, in chapter 12? God chooses one language. The language of Abraham. And what actually happens at the Pentecost, you guys? Yes, language unifies again. And it's through, now we, it's not that we all speak the same language. It's that Peter got up and he just started to speak whatever and everybody seemed to understand whatever he was saying, right? That's the work of the Spirit. He's bringing redemption to all mankind, right? And that's the Pentecost right there. So do you see the unifying message? Pentecost. Right? That's the, that's the unified message of the Bible. And that's why it's important that we bring this one man, Abraham, into the story. Because it's through this one person that God is going to try to bring about this moment. Right? The cross. So, I love Abraham. If I, when I, not if I, praise the Lord, Lord willing, when I go to be with him, He's definitely one of those people that I would like to just sit down and if there's coffee in heaven, I'd like to <laughs> drink coffee with Abraham, one-on-one. -on -one. Since there's eternity, there is real no time. Time, did you know time is an actual physical thing that can be measured and bent? Time can be bent. I, Einstein discovered this. So Abraham, yeah, time can actually be bent. It had to do with the planet Mercury, but whatever. So. Chapter 11, verse 27 to 32. He says, <clears throat> I'm going to read it really quickly, okay? 
Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Ha Haran fathered Lot. Remember Lot? I hear music. Jesus? Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in the Ur of the Chaldeans. <clears throat> Let me actually show you the map here. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. This is going to be the pivotal point of Abraham's story, is the fact that Sarai is barren. Can't have children. Now, when you read, uh, so let's show you, kind of, this is where he starts out in Ur, and then he transplants to Haran, right around there. So that's where the story begins. So, you know, uh, we like to think often, somebody asked a great question yesterday about, you know, did Abraham know God? I don't think so. You know, because, you know, the Jewish people, fascinating people, I, I've had a huge fascination with the Jew. At one point in my high school and college years, I, w I wanted to be Jew. I wanted to find me a good Jewish man so that I could actually convert to Judaism, right? I have a million of my ways, don't worry. So the Jewish people believe that God was digging through the trash of the world. The world had become just complete trash, right? And in the trash of the world, he found this one bottle of perfume, just beautiful, it smelled so good, and it was Abraham. So then God took Abraham and took him around and just spritzed the world with the beauty of Abraham. Okay, so this is the Jewish understanding of Abraham. I don't think that's the case. They obviously have not read Joshua or <laughs> Luke. Joshua says, uh, the Lord, the, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Tirah the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. And it's actually believed that uh, Abraham's family, just from different things, they believe that Abraham's family was a family of idol makers. Now you consider this. His wife Sarai is barren. What do you think Abraham, Abram has been doing? Sacrifice. Yeah, I think he was trying to sacrifice to as many idols as he can to try to... He genuinely loves his wife. That's why he only has one wife. It's very unusual. Right? If you, one wife is barren, you just get another one. But he really wants to stay true to her. I, I think he's a very honorable person. And so he's sacrificing, I bet you anything. I mean, I'm only conjecturing, but he was probably sacrificing to a whole bunch of idols. None of them seemed to work. So then all of a sudden, one day, who knows what Abram was doing, maybe taking care of his flock, maybe he was building some idols, I don't know, right? is where you get chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. This is going to be the most important verse, possibly, arguably, of the entire Bible, OK? <laughs> Completely arguable. Who would like to read this for me in a really loud voice and just proclaim it out, as if you were God? I will give you the volunteer opportunity. If not, I will call on you. <laughs> just be brave. Yes, thank you. You just call it out. Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. Mm -hmm. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. So, does Abraham, Abram know who this God is? I am going to propose to you that he doesn't. He doesn't know who Yahweh is. He is most likely one of these. One of these. Yes, one of these. Okay, so what are these? These are actually called teraphims. These are household gods. Every household had a god. They protected, they gave wealth. And you know when Rachel steals her father's household gods? Yeah, this is probably what they look like. You actually have to have these in order to inherit your father's uh, inheritance, right? So possibly Abraham built lots of idols, or worships a lots of idols at least. Here's this voice, and what are the things that this voice promises him? I will make you a great nation, which means I will give you lots of descendants, right? I will bless you and make your name great, your identity great. People will know you, right? I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. I will protect you. I will give you physical protection. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I think Abraham could have cared less about the last three. 
he just wants a child. <laughs> he wants to at least have a natural heir. So I think I would like to propose to you that Abraham takes up this God on his promise. Abraham's like, okay, sure. And if the condition for me to receive these things is to leave my land, all right, I'll do it. So he starts to move from Haran, 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 with his nephew Lot. He takes Lot with him and goes down to Canaan. So what I'm gonna, I'm gonna propose, and this is a journey that I'm gonna do, and it's called Abraham's journey. And chapters 12 to 15, I'm gonna propose to you that it's the season of revelation. It's the season of Abram beginning to understand who God is. Who is this God? And many of you and many of us are in that place. Who exactly is this God? Right, what does he do? What is he like? <clears throat> so you'll start to read in chapter 12. You know, this is, oh man, you guys have to do a map. I just sent this to you. Don't look at this, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is not a good map. <laughs> okay, Yo says it's okay. So he starts to start to wander. He moves from there, he goes down to uh, Damascus, he goes to Hatsor, I mean, he goes to all sorts of places. He goes to Shechem. You know, every time you see in the Bible the letters CH when you're reading a Jewish name, you have to pronounce it like a <laughs> like you're like gargling something, you have to spit it out. So it's Shechem. <laughs> Shechem, right? So it's not Shechem. Because Shechem actually sounds like a bad word in Korean, right? <laughs> Sheki. <laughs> Shechem, right? Now don't worry about it. So, he understands what I'm saying. <laughs> so the first thing that Abraham starts to do, you see that he keeps wandering. He can't settle. Why? It's because he's a foreigner. See, the Canaan is kind of like the wilderness. He comes from the city. It's like uh, he had been coming from New York and then moving to Oklahoma. I don't know. Not. Well, who's from Oklahoma? Who did I offend right now? <laughs> Kansas or I'm not sure, right? Iowa, right? It's moving from a large city into a rural, pay, rural place. And these people, remember, are territorial. They're, they're territory driven. And here comes this like foreigner and he's trying to like try find a his own little space. What is happening? He's being rejected. And then Abram, he keeps building these altars. Every time he builds an altar, what do you think he's saying? You know, you, you've been in this place. God's asked you to come out of your safety zone and do some crazy things in your life with YWAM. What do you say when you get to your Shechem? Where are you? You called me out. I'm here. What are you doing? Build an altar, right? He's treating God, you know, he's burning stuff, right? Where are you? He moves and then he builds a second altar. Eventually there's a famine in Canaan, right? And this is not an un unusual occurrence. That land is very dry. You know, uh, that's why you'll see in Joseph's time, they gotta move out of there again because famine is a, is a usual occurrence. And Abram goes to Egypt, which is not unusual. Egypt, like I said yesterday, is always fertile because the Nile River is always there. It's always a constant source of water. Do you know the Nile actually flows from east to, from south to north? Mm -hmm. So Egypt, this is, the upper part is called Lower Egypt, and then this part is actually called Upper Egypt. Yeah, so whenever you read about Lower Upper, it's reversed because of the flow of the Nile. So Abram moves down to Egypt. And all this, you know, you, you most likely have read the story and you're like, ah, cool. And the only thing that sticks out in your mind is Abram sold his wife. Dude, he sold her out, right? And he does. He goes there and his wife is probably like 65 years old. She must have been some really beautiful woman. I'm serious. She must have been so beautiful at 65 because Pharaoh's servants see her, see her and they're like, wow, we got to get her to Pharaoh. <laughs> Right, 65, right? Wow, that's cool, that's cool. She must, she must, no wonder Abraham was like, just Sarah, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he sells her, basically. The reason I say that he sells her is because Pharaoh richly blesses Abraham, gives him flocks, animals, male, female servants. I mean, it's, it's one thing to give animals, but to give human servants is quite costly, right? 
And that's most likely Hagar is one of the servants that are given. And, you know, Abraham's in trouble. <laughs> Abraham's in a lot of trouble here, right? He just lost his wife. And then God comes and starts to inflict disease on Egypt. Okay, now let's think about this. You gotta stop. See, the Bible, you gotta, you gotta meditate. Slowly think about these things, one thing at a time. Think about what it means that Pharaoh, his household, and his officials start, are starting to get diseased. Who's controlling this disease? Now remember, during the, the Middle Bronze Age, this is the Middle Bronze Age that you're in. During the Middle Bronze Age, Egypt was, if not the po most powerful, the most, it was one of the most powerful nations in the world. And remember, power is always coupled with religion. And if Egypt is powerful, it's because Egypt's gods are powerful. And Abram's god begins to inflict disease on Pharaoh, who himself is a god. What is Abraham beginning to learn? Wow, he's actually, well, this god? I don't know who he is, but he's actually, he's able to have influence and dominion over Egypt, Egypt's gods, and Pharaoh. It's a moment of realization, right? And then Pharaoh is like, oh my God, get out of here. <laughs> get out of here, right? Chases him out, and then he chases him out with all this wealth. And Abraham comes out of this in a moment of very human weakness, a very, very wealthy man. See, this is weird. God's, God's actions are so weird. Like, he just did something not nice. It was naughty. And then he comes out even blessed for it. It's like, that's God's economy. Who, go figure, right? Praise the Lord, that's often how he treats us. Yeah. We're, just, we're dumb. <laughs> we make dumb choices that are selfish and then it comes out and like, somehow we come out blessed. It's just so weird and ironic. I, just, I don't get it. But praise the Lord for grace. So he returns to the Negev, which is the south of, it's right there, right near the, the Red Sea, the Dead Sea. And it's at that moment you know, they've amassed great wealth, both him and his nephew Lot, that he actually decides to let Lot go, right? He says, you choose. And Lot says, yeah, I, I want Sodom and Gomorrah, that region. You know, to me, it's a very significant move because I personally believe, and you can disagree with me, neither of us will go to hell for disagreeing on this one. I personally believe that he lets Lot go because I think he was kind of banking on Lot. You know, if I don't have somebody to be my, uh, someone to inherit from me, I'm just going to give it to Lot. Right? That's what I personally think. And this is a real big move that Abram makes. He's beginning to let go. Lot, you go your way. Right? And then, this is when God comes. God comes to Abram, chapter 13, verse 14, right? And every time God comes, I want you to notice something. The promise begins to, God begins to give a little bit more realization, right? Abram makes a move, and God gives more realization. Abram makes a move, and God gives greater revelation. Do you see how this is moving, right? Mm -hmm. He comes back with this realization from Egypt, and then he looks at Lot and says goodbye, and then God comes, chapter 13, right? Verse 14, and I'm just going to read it really quick. The Lord said to Abram after, after Lot had separated from him, right? The text specifically says, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. Do you see, that wasn't part of the original promise in chapter 12. It's a growth. It's a growth of revelation. And he says, do you see all this land that you're looking at? This is the land that I will give to you and to your descendants forever. So it begins to move and expand. So he, li he moves to a city called Mamre, and he's kind of there, and he builds his third altar there. Now, when you get to chapter 14, really, really interesting, because it's so random. The Bible looks really random, but it's, I, I personally believe that it's really beginning to build. Because in chapter 14, you get this really weird battle of the four kings versus the five kings. When you guys read this, it's like, what the? Yeah. And then you get this weird, mysterious figure of Melchizedek, right? So, this is a Babylonian king shooting an arrow. Isn't that cool? Their beards. 
Like, they must have been some really hairy people if they could braid their beard like that. That's cool. Yes. Uh -huh. So, let, just really quickly, I bet you could. <laughs> so let's just really quickly, these are the four kings. Amraphel, Arioch, Kedor, Leomer, and Tidal, right? So these are the four kings. They're incredibly powerful because they are able to subjugate these five kings. Bera, Birsha, Shinab, Shemaber, and the king of Bela, right? And interesting part is where it says, let's see, 14, 5. Uh, I'm just going to read these kings off really quickly. Chapter 14, verse 5, it says, In the 14th year, Kedor Laomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and Zuzi Minham, the Emim in Shavakir Yathaim, right? So wh what does that all mean, right? If you do research on these people, these people were actually considered giants. If you do research, some of these people had beds that were like 13 feet wide. Okay, they either wanted really giant beds <laughs> or they were very large people. And the fact that these four kings could actually conquer them means that they were very powerful. So for 12 years, these kings served those four kings. And then in the 13th year, these five kings are like, we ain't giving you any more money. And we're not going to send any more people to you. That's usually what tribute is. And so in the 14th year, the four kings are like, we're not going to stand for this. We're going to go down and we're going to squash them, right? And make them pay tribute again, right? Or kill them. But so four kings eventually go down and they capture those five kings. One of those kings is the king of Sodom, where who is staying? Lot. Lot is staying there. And news comes to Abram. You know, he's, he's staying with his friend Mamre, right? News comes to him. And then Abraham rallies his homegrown 318. I mean, that's pretty impressive, honestly, right? He's creating his own little tribe there. 318 soldiers. Okay, well, let's talk about the army of the four kings. Okay, so I did some research. Very famous, um, like a historical archeolo archeological theologian. Her name is Stephanie Daly. Says that during the Middle Bronze Age, if a nation were s was small, their army consisted of somewhere between two to 4,000 soldiers. Okay? So two times, let's say, let's do conservative. Two times four, it's about 8,000, right? A large army would consist of probably possibly somewhere between 20 to 60,000. Okay, so 20,000 times four, okay, that's not very good, 80,000, right? So let's go conservative. Let's say the four kings bring out their, their uh, 8,000 army, and then Abraham brings out his 318 homegrown soldiers, <laughs> and it says <coughs> that Abram chased the four kings all the way from the Valley of Sedim to up there. Chased them. Defeated them. And you're like, wait a minute, a little bit something's weird, right? And that's where this very mysterious figure comes in. Melchizedek. He, he is a very mysterious person because he shows up in Hebrews and then he shows up in the Psalms. And many people will believe that this is actually a, a Christophany. It's a physical embodied presence of Christ. And people will say that because what are the two things he brings? Bread and wine. It's just like the Eucharist, right? Or when you break bread. Uh, other people will just say that he is king and priest of a city called Salem or Salem, which eventually becomes Jerusalem. You decide. Okay, you let the spirit talk to you, both are great, okay? You won't go to hell for either. So he shows up and he makes a really, really interesting prayer, okay? So I need to be, Aaron, can you read for me as you're typing? Yes. Chapter 14, verse 19 to 20, and pretend you are Melchizedek. Okay. Chapter 14, 19 to 20, it's a blessing. Yes. Chap Melchizedek blessed Abram with his blessing. Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. Okay, so Melchizedek shows up. And what is the first thing he says? He says, he's a king, but he's also a priest. And he says to Abram, I am a priest. I serve the same God.